Our speaker today is Stephen Herman. And any introduction to Stephen Herman best begins with an introduction to William Everson. William Everson was a brilliant poet of the San Francisco Renaissance who joined the Catholic Church and the Dominican Order in 1951, taking the name Brother Antoninus. In 1956, he encountered Victor White, who introduced him to the works of Carl Jung, which he voraciously devoured. Mm -hmm. Antoninus wrote a long erotic poem called River Root Asizizigi, which he saw as a complete rewriting of the Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. Antoninus left the order and the Catholic Church by disrobing himself of his religious habit following an electrifying poetry reading at UC Davis on December 7th, 1969. Everson taught a famous class called Birth of a Poet at UC Santa Cruz, where our speaker, Stephen Herman, became his teaching assistant in 1980. Stephen Herman's conversations with Everson became his first book, William Everson, The Shaman's Call. Stephen Herman went on to work with another modern shaman, Donald Sandner, at the C.G. Young Institute. Sandner conducted a long inquiry into the relationship between Jungian psychology and shamanism. In addition to numerous articles and reviews, Stephen Herman has written five books that explore the relationship between poetry, shamanism, and Jungian psychology. They include Spiritual Democracy, The Wisdom of Early American Visionaries for the Journey Forward, Walt Whitman, Shamanism, Spiritual Democracy, and the World Soul. Emily Dickinson, A Medicine Woman for Our Times. Mm -hmm. His latest book is called William James and C.G. Young, Doorways to the Self. It should be on sale very soon from Analytical Psychology Press. And if you go to their website, uh, it's all one word, www.analyticalpsychologypress.com. And uh, look for Stephen Herman. You will find this book. And I can send that link out later and put it up on our Facebook page. Stephen Herman is a Jungian analyst with a private practice in Montclair. Please give a warm welcome for Stephen Herman. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Stephen. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm I'm very happy to be able to be speaking about this subject, which has uh, been very uh, dear to me since, as uh, Stephen mentioned, I uh, had the pleasure of taking William Everson's course at UC Santa Cruz. Now, this was a course in charismatic vocation, not confined to poets alone, but to any student who had a calling. Um, the aim of the course was to see if you could confirm your vocation through your dream life. Mm -hmm. And I was asked by Bill to uh, be his teaching assistant when I was an undergraduate in the experimental psychology program. Um, I wrote a paper in a transitional moment um, on vocation. It was a 44 page paper and section seven of that paper, which I wrote in 1979 uh, for a tutorial uh, under Everson's tutelage was called um, Vocational Dreams and Synchronistic Phenomena. So I've been sitting on this material happily for 41 years. Um, and it's a delight to be able to uh, speak about it today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the um, uh, screen share here. Um, can you all see that now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to just say a couple of things about my work under Everson. Um, one was that he um, read the paper and gave me a very wonderful uh, glowing narrative evaluation that meant a great deal to me as a young man of 23. 
Um, the subject for today comes from that paper. Um, it's now being published, uh, the idea, uh, the notion, in chapter 37 of my new book, um, which you can see here, William James and C. G. Jung, Doorways to the Self. And um, here's a picture of someone we're all familiar with, C. G. Jung. Uh, here's William James, the founder of American psychology and the father of pragmatism in America, who Jung had the great pleasure of meeting in 1909 when he traveled to Clark University with Sigmund Freud and Sandor Ferenczi. Jung met William James a second time, although it's not generally known, in 1910. He came a second time to the States and uh, had a long walking uh, tour with James when James told him he could hear his heart beating. And William James died shortly thereafter, after a uh, tour through Switzerland, where he visited Zurich, and then uh, died after his return to America. Now, I mentioned the uh, paper I wrote uh, for Everson's tutorial. At the same time I was finishing that paper, I had a uh, vocational dream. This was a dream uh, involving a, an ascent to a, a mountaintop with a colleague, a friend uh, at the university uh, who was in a pro seminar on Jung with me. And we were uh, ascending the mountain and uh, then uh, I went back down to the shores of the lake, which was somewhere in California, and um, foothills of the Sierras, no, no doubt. And I encountered this king snake uh, with these uh, cosmic looking eyes with a spiral looking galaxy that uh, circumambulated or spiraled inward toward a center with stars in the eyes. And that snake um, began to uh, move towards the Kresge Town Hall where Everson taught his course. Um, I uh, walked with a uh, religious studies teacher of mine to the town hall. And after that dream, I decided to leave the experimental psychology program at uh, Cal College and um, write my own individual major in depth psychology and religion. Here's a, a picture of uh, my king snake drum. This is a Taoist drum I purchased uh, in 1995. And as Stephen mentioned, uh, I was uh, seeing Don Sander at the time in analysis, and uh, he played a big uh, role in. Um, inspiring me to go down and interview uh, Everson before he died on the subject of shamanism in American poetry. Here's a, a spiral galaxy um, mirroring the eyes of the snake or vice versa. This is a picture of William Everson. By this time, this picture was taken in the late 70s when I knew him as William Everson. Before that, he had been Brother Antoninus. He left the religious order, uh, disrobed himself at UC Davis, and uh, went to a little uh, shop in Mill Valley and found a bear claw necklace and a buckskin vest, and he wore that as his new mantle, uh, as he said, uh, as a, uh, a Latter-day poet shaman. And that's how I knew him. He was 44 years my senior. He was like a wise old man, uh, a Jungian scholar and poet, Jungian poet of the Pacific uh, Coast. Lived in Santa Cruz. Now, I mentioned the dream of the snake. Um, and on November 7th, and that was shortly after that dream, I was sitting outside the provost's office at Cal College, who
who was also my religious studies teacher. He taught uh, introduction to Indic religious traditions and Buddhism. And I had taken his course and I was gonna go speak to him about changing my major. And I had decided that I was going to write my major, my thesis, my senior thesis on Meister Eckhart and Carl Jung, Recollections of the Self. And as I was waiting for um, Jack to come, Jack Angler was, is his name, um, I was sitting uh, beneath some redwood trees on the UC Santa Cruz campus and a young woman approached me. And she started to speak to me in a German accent and I asked her her name. And she told me her name was Gabriella Eckhart. So when she said that, uh, I began speaking German with her for about 10 minutes or so. And she told me she was from Carmel uh, by the sea, Carmel, California, where I was born. Well, by the time I got uh, ready to enter Jack's office, I had made up my decision because as I said, this part seven of that paper that I was writing at this time and ready to submit to Everson it was called um, Vocational Dreams and Synchronistic Events. And uh, I had never uh, met uh, a young uh, woman or any person with the last name of Eckhart here in, in the States. So it was one of those coincidences that Jung speaks about in his uh, monograph on synchronicity that was so baffling uh, and beyond uh, statistical probability that I said, I think that I know what I'm gonna do and, and that confirmed my decision. This is a, uh, a plaque on the uh, Predigerkirche. This is the church of Meister Eckhart in Erfurt, Germany. And Eckhart lived from 1260 to 1328. And uh, I wrote a thesis on Eckhart, as I said. Now, right after I made my decision and submitted my um, new uh, major to the, um, to the university, and it became official, I took a class called Explorations of the Self, where we were uh, reading William James's uh, masterpiece, The Varieties of Religious Experience. Now, this house uh, was occupied by Jung and his family in the year 1909. The, right around the same time he returned from his trip to America where he met William James. You can see the, the beautiful architecture there. This is the front door to Jung's house in Kusnacht, for those of you who haven't seen it or been there. There I am standing at the doorway. This was in 2008 when I delivered a paper at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And here above the door, we read vocatus atque non vocatus deus aderit, which translates as called or not called, God will be present. This is a back view of Carl Jung's home from the lake of Zurich side. And after Jung's break with Sigmund Freud, most of you know, he began to engage in a building game on the shores of the lake that reminded him of childhood play activities where he constructed a little church and he was looking for a stone and found a red pyramidal stone that he used as the uh, spire or the, um, the roof of the church. And uh, it was a pyramidal stone that was just right. Uh, there's a synchronicity for you. And at that moment, Jung remembered his dream from the age of three of a great underground phallus that stood about 12 feet high on a throne with an eye looking motionlessly upward and an aura of brightness, as he said, shining above it. This was the dream that 
sealed Jung's vocation. Although he didn't know it until he remembered that dream, even though he'd been playing a, a little game with a little mannequin where reveries from that dream were still alive and active during his latency years. I wrote my dissertation, uh, Vocational Development in Childhood, and spoke at length about that dream. Um, Jung wrote down his fantasies very carefully in his black books and his red book. And this was done in a, a calligraphic script with great uh, beauty. Now, this is a very important point in understanding uh, vocation. Uh, this uh, midlife transition that Jung spoke of. Um, Jung said the onset of midlife is around uh, 35. This happens to co coincide exactly with his uh, chance uh, meetings with James at 34 and 35. In the midst of this period, Jung wrote in his memories, dreams, reflections, when I was so preoccupied with the images of the unconscious, I came to the decision to withdraw from the university where I lectured for eight years as privat docent. My experience and experiments with the unconscious had brought my intellectual activity to a standstill. After the completion of the psychology of the unconscious, I found myself utterly incapable of reading a scientific book. This went on for three years. Imagine Carl Jung with the intellect that he had not reading a scientific book for three years. What was he doing? Well, he was working on his red book, re relating well to his family and seeing patients, but he was also engaging in play activities and working with painting and stones. Here we have a picture of a stone figure that was carved in the year 1920. The unconscious gave the name Atma Victu, which means the breath of life, the breath of life. 1920. Here it is in the garden at Kusnacht, standing near an evergreen. And you'll see several pictures of this figure. I, I was fascinated with it when I saw it. Atma Viktu, first spelled with a K, was a fantasy figure that emerged in C.G. Jung's Black Book on the 6th of April in 19... Uh, uh, Black Book 6 on April 25th, 1917. This is a picture from below, looking up at the uh, face and upper torso of the figure. Now the influenza, which was called the Spanish flu by some, broke out in February of 1918 and it ended in April of 1920. So this figure was carved exactly a hundred years ago. And I think it stands as a, a symbol of hope during this current COVID-19 pandemic that we're going through. It's said that 50 million people died during the 1918-1919 pandemic lasted till early 1920 in April. So we're looking at a figure that's a uh, hundred years old here. It's beautifully preserved. There's another uh, image of Atma Victu. Now here's a, a photograph that gives you perspective. You see the uh, tree standing tall above the figure. Uh, 
Now in the Shandogya Upanishad, the supremacy of the prana, we read, Om, he who knows what is oldest becomes himself the oldest and the greatest. The prana indeed is the oldest and the greatest. Prana in Sanskrit is translated as breath. And look at how old the face on this figure looks. This is an archaic image that Jung carved, part of what he called the archaic psyche. In another Upanishad, there's a little prayer, I am prana, meditate on me as the conscious self, prajnatman, as life, as immortality. Life is prana, prana is life. Immortality is prana, prana is immortality. Prana is consciousness, consciousness is prana. In Black Book 6, and the Black Books, by the way, are now in print and can be ordered. Sonar Dasani has been working on these for a number of years, and they're, uh, they're now available. Atma Viktu was said to have been the companion of the serpent for, for thousands of years. This is from Jung's Red Book now. He was at first an old man, then he, was through, he went through a series of four consecutive deaths, passing in theriomorphic form from an old man to serpent, followed by his quintessential transformation into the figure Philemon. He transformed into a bear, then an otter, a newt, a serpent, conjurer, the kernel of the self, and finally into the winged spirit, Philemon, who taught Jung the method of psychic objectivity, or what he called the reality of the psyche. So long before I became aware of Jung's associations to the figure of Atma Viktu in Black Book 6, I wrote a little poem called Atma Viktu. And that was before I traveled to Zurich to speak at the ETH in the summer of 2008. Someone asked me when I was photographing the figure, what is that, who is that? And I said, Atma Viktu, Atma Viktu. And I said it in the opening lines of the poem that I had written while I was, uh, uh, writing a lot of uh, poetry in my journals uh, in the late 90s. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of me in front of Carl Jung's window at the back of the house or the side of the house, I believe, yeah. And uh, in my dissertation in 1994, which I mentioned, Vocational uh, Development in Childhood, I wrote, this is an image of, uh, of a symbol for the collective unconscious with soul substance to it. It's the archetype of Jung's vocation, which was to make the unconscious conscious. It was through this symbol that Jung's unconscious spoke to him in the form of a calling, i.e. vocatus, as we saw above the door in Latin. Now, when I was teaching at the university uh, under Everson, I used to recite a passage from Jung's uh, collected writings where he said that the dream is a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul, opening into that cosmic night, which was psyche long before there was any ego consciousness and which will remain psyche, no matter how far our ego consciousness may extend. In dreams, we put on the form of that more real, truer, more eternal man dwelling in the darkness of primordial night. There he is still the one and the one is in him, indistinguishable from all nature and bare of all egohood. Now, Jung, by the time he carved this figure, which was originally uh, 
carved in two wooden uh, carvings in, in London when he was uh, giving lectures there. Um, by, by this time in 1920, he had really developed a form of psychological thinking. And I think it begins with this narrative of uh, this nuclear symbol, the, a vocational imprint for something transcendent in his instinctive and spiritual nature, or a symbol for the non-dual self in a person. You see, already at the age of three, there was the underground phallus in the earth, in the depths of the earth. And he referred to this as a, um, a symbol for um, telesphorus. Um, this is a backside, and, and that was a... Um, that was a little mannequin figure that he uh, carved uh, on a pencil when he was um, playing a game in his attic. And he, he hid this little figure up in the attic and bedded it down with um, cotton and put the little figure in a pencil case during his latency years. So already as a child, Jung was playing with his figure. This, by the time he carves it in 1920, after the pandemic, or uh, around the same time, he also carves this spine uh, in the back, you can see. And it's a marvelous um, image because it shows something that has a foundation to it. It has grounding, it has, has a sense of uh, an erect posture to it. Um, he had also discovered Kundalini Yoga by this time. Now, in a book by Marie Louise von Franz and James Hillman, von Franz wrote a, a chapter on the inferior function which most of you will be familiar with. The inferior function is part of one's psychological makeup, uh, what Jung called type, uh, a psychological type. Uh, von Franz said that the inferior function is the door through which all the figures of the unconscious come into consciousness. Our conscious realm is a room with four doors, and it is the fourth door by which the um, the shadow, the animus, and the personification of the self come in. It's a beautiful uh, quote by von Franz, I think. Um, this is a carving of Jung's a bowling and stone which he carved in 1950. This is a wonderful story in his uh, memoir of a, uh, a mistake that happened when the uh, stonemason brought a stone to the bowling in where Jung was waiting for it. And um, Jung had expected to see a triangular piece of stone, but this, square a piece of stone came instead. And the, uh, the stonemason was so upset, he got furious and was gonna return it. He told the uh, delivery uh, men to take it away. And Jung said, no, that's my stone. That's my stone. So you see, by 1950, Jung was ready to write his monograph on synchronicity, and he knew what that meant immediately when he saw it. Carving in stone was one of Jung's ways of getting in touch with his inferior function, which uh, was extroverted sensation, if I'm correct. Jung carved the words uh, on the stone in Greek 
Time is a child playing like a child, playing a board game, the kingdom of the child. This is Telus for us, who roams through the dark regions of the cosmos and glows like a star out of the depths and points the way to the gates of the sun and the land of dreams. Very poetic. Now, just as a contrast, I'm showing you a picture of the California poet Robinson Jeffers. This is the granite doorway to his famous uh, granite uh, structure that he built out of uh, tide-worn stones that he dredged up from the Pacific Hawk Tower. His wife asked him to construct it. I published a piece in this journal um, for the Robinson Jeffers Association called The Shamanic Archetype in Robinson Jeffers Poetry. In that paper, I have a quote from Jeffers, and here I am entering uh, Hawk Tower, which I equate with uh, an entrance into what Jung called the psychoid, and I'll speak a little bit about that later. Jeffers wrote that the polar ice caps are melting, the mountain glaciers drip into rivers, all feed the ocean, tides ebb and flow, but every year a little bit higher, they will drown New York, they will drown London, but Hawk Tower will hold against the seas buffeting. It will become geological, fossil, permanent. By uh, coincidence, five minutes before I uh, was gonna uh, talk to Stephen about preparing this Zoom, uh, presentation. My wife, Lori, who's a Jungian analyst, showed me that this was in the front page of the um, uh, San Francisco uh, Chronicle uh, in the date book. It's called Back to Nature, and here's a picture of uh, Robinson Jeffers, and there's Hawk Tower for you right there. And this happened five minutes before, uh, and Lori happens to be an extroverted intuitive, and these kinds of things just happen sometimes. Yeah, as Jung said, they're just so. Wood and stone carvings in Jung's garden in Kusnacht and at Bollingen contributed to the strengthening of Jung's superior function of introverted intuition, a connection which San Francisco Jungian analyst John Beebe says creates the spine of consciousness that gives a personality a backbone. Just want to go back to, uh, you see. So carving in stone was Jung's way of forming a, a bridge to his inferior function and uh, connecting him with nature and with the psychoid, which is the psychophysical background that underlies reality and the uh, zone from which synchronistic phenomena appear to be organized. As Jung said, synchronicity is an organizing principle. Who the organizer is behind synchronistic events is forever unknown and mysterious. But when these things happen to us, um, as those who've noted in this uh, group will, will know, it creates a certain kind of a uh, aha moment, like, Hmm, okay, uh, that's what he was talking about. Wood, wood and stone carvings, uh, I spoke about that. Okay, uh, here's a, uh, an example of some carving that I did. I mentioned Jung's two wooden carvings in, in, that he did in England of Atma Victu before the stone piece. These are out of cypress wood, and this is a king snake. The first is a feathered serpent. And the second is a uh, cypress wood carving of a spirit canoe that I did, patterned after the Coast Salish Indians of uh, the Northwest Pacific Coast. Now, Jung speaks of dreams as facts, and he says that he avoided all theoretical points of view during this period he wasn't reading scientific texts, and simply helped the patients to understand the dream images by themselves without application to rules and theories. In Jung's view, dreams are the facts from which we must proceed. 
Significantly, these statements came right after the place in his book, which was really co-authored with his secretary, Aniel Yaffe, where the uh, chapter on William James was supposed to have been placed. This is the Count Way Library manuscript or CLM at Harvard Medical School, which I had the good fortune to have been able to research. And it's a fascinating document. And what it shows is that between the chapter on Sigmund Freud and the confrontation of the unconscious was a chapter on Theodore Flournoy and C.G. Jung and William James that was omitted. This is a very significant piece of writing. It's short and very packed. And I've been doing some, I, I speak about it in my new book. Jung's uh, discovery of active imagination is uh, a, a method whereby emotions were translated into images. And Jung said that if he had not done this, he would have been torn apart by his emotions or affects. Um, and when he did that, he was calmed and reinsured uh, whenever he worked with uh, symbols. Now, from a therapeutic uh, point of view, he taught his patients uh, in Zurich from many parts of the world that the aim is to find the particular images which lie behind the emotions. Here's a picture of Philemon. Remember now that uh, Atma Viktu went through a, a number of transformations uh, and eventually this figure emerged in a 1915 dream where a, a winged man was flying through the sky and he had kingfisher wings. He was holding four keys and in his outstretched hand, he was uh, clutching a key as if he were going to open a door. Now, as Jung was painting this figure in what we now have as his red book published in 2009 by Sonar Shamdasani, he also uh, noted that there was a meaningful coincidence that occurred and that was that he discovered a dead kingfisher in his garden. And kingfishers are exceedingly rare in the vicinity of Zurich. So this was clearly beyond uh, the laws of probability. And Jung carefully documented these uh, events when they occurred and um, kept a careful record. Here's a uh, painting of a uh, snake uh, uprising with fire from a volcanic uh, looking source and a picture of the shadow, picture 115. Now Jung uh, used uh, some yoga techniques uh, while he was composing his red book in order not to be torn apart by his affects, as he said. So he was doing some kind of breathing exercises and perhaps some uh, Hatha yoga postures, but we don't know much about this. What we do know is that Jung says in his uh, memories, dreams, reflections, that he only used yoga as long as uh, he could get himself calmed. And at that point, he began to engage again with his inner images. The Indian, he says, on the other hand, does yoga exercises in order, eight, in order to obliterate completely the multitude of psychic contents and images. <laughs> As I mentioned, I studied um, with Jack Engler and I wrote a paper on Kundalini Yoga the same time I was writing the paper on vocation in 1979. And I was practicing Iyengar Yoga. And I continue to practice yoga today, but I still can remember my dreams. So Jung's ideas about uh, yoga and his caution to Westerners about the practice of yoga have recently been uh, written about and revised. The self. Well, in the confrontation with the unconscious, 
Jung spoke of the mandala as the center. It's the, uh, a very important concept to grasp in relationship to the archetype of your vocation. Jung said it's the exponent of all paths. It's the path to the center to individuation. During those years between 1918 and 1920, now notice the years, 1918 to 1920 coincides exactly with the outbreak of the pandemic and the, the escalation of it and then final uh, uh, diminishing of it. But during that time, uh, he understood better that the goal of psychic development is the self. There's no inner uh, linear evolution. There's only a circumambulation around the self. Uniform development exists at most only at the beginning. Later, everything points toward the center. This is a picture I painted after my dream of a California king snake on a cross, because I was, as I said, studying Meister Eckhart at the time. There's four snakes uh, and one in the center. Those are ones uh, in the outer uh, part uh, of the uh, image represent uh, the Euroboros. Um, and uh, you can see the four functions of consciousness there depicted in the port. port. The, you know, Jung said, uh, you don't have to be an artist, great artist. You just draw them uh, as best you can. So that's about as best as I could do. Now, in 1927, Jung had what he called a Liverpool dream. This was uh, a dream where there was a center uh, and it was a round pool. And in the middle of it was an island and there stood a single tree, a magnolia and a shower of reddish blossoms. It's as though the tree stood in the sunlight and were at the same time the source of light, he said. Through this dream, I understood that the self is the archetype of orientation and meaning, and therein lies its healing function. And this insight signified an approach to the center and therefore to the goal. Out of it uh, emerged my first inkling of what he called his personal myth, his myth of individuation or the myth of the continuing expansion of consciousness. This is a portrait he painted after the dream of uh, what's called the window on eternity. Another metaphor for a doorway is a window. It's a gorgeous uh, painting. Now that's art if, if I've ever seen it. Jung claimed that he wasn't doing art in a dialogue with his anima or soul. But we all know now that he was a great artist too. Now, The Secret of the Golden Castle. This is at the end of his Red Book period, uh, 1928. Uh, he painted a second picture, likewise a mandala with a golden castle in the center. When it was finished, he asked himself, why is it so Chinese? He was impressed by the form and choice of, of it, and it seemed to him um, as if there was something very Chinese about it. Uh, yet that was how it affected Jung, uh, he says. It was a coincidence that shortly afterwards he received uh, a letter from Richard Wilhelm, uh, the great uh, sinologist uh, who translated the I Ching, which Jung used, of course, and enclosed in the manuscript was a Taoist alchemical treatise called The Secret of the Golden Flower with a request that he write a commentary on it. Now, this is what Jung would later call a synchronicity. In fact, the word synchronicity was coined in his dream seminars in that same year, 1928. Here's a picture of it, and you can see it does look remarkably Chinese. You can see down at the bottom the year 1928. Now, Jung made a point in his um, writings to say that working with active imagination and dreams uh, requires the taking of ethical responsibility. Uh, we have to understand our inner images and draw ethical conclusions from them. 
And stopping short, he said, conjures up the negative effects of the unconscious. This insight uh, into them must be converted into ethical obligation. The images of the unconscious place a great responsibility upon a man or a woman. Failure to understand or shirking of ethical responsibility deprives him or her of his or her wholeness and imposes a painful fragmentariness on her life. So here's uh, the book uh, that uh, Stephen mentioned in his very warm introduction, uh, The Shaman's Call, published in 2009. Following year, I published uh, my book on Walt Whitman, Shamanism, Spiritual Democracy, and the World's Soul. This is a picture of Walt Whitman, 1819 to 1892 was his lifetime. He's seated next to Peter Doyle. Peter Doyle was a streetcar man that Whitman met and befriended and had a very warm and affectionate relationship with, a homoerotic, you could say, and homo spiritual relationship with. They were dear friends. And there they are seated in a marriage pose. This is 1860s. I speak about this at length in my book, Spiritual Democracy. This is Herman Melville. He appears in part two of my book, Spiritual Democracy. Of course, everyone knows Herman Melville was the great author of Moby Dick, who Jung said in 1931 in his essay, Analytical Psychology and Literature, was the greatest visionary artist of America. His years coincide almost exactly with Whitman. Now, as I was writing my manuscript on Herman Melville that got published in what is now the Young Journal, and uh, <clears throat> Diane Sherwood was the editor at the time. Uh, this is back in 2002, I published 2003, a paper called Melville's Vision of Evil. Um, <clears throat> I'd been working with a young boy who came into my practice at the age of, of four, and um, <clears throat> he jumped up on my couch and with his mother next to him, this is the initial session, the first session, and he had a little sword with him and he started throwing the sword at the carpet, picking it up again, jumping back on the couch and throwing it again. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm spearing whales. I said, what? You're spearing whales? Where did you learn this? He said, I saw a movie. Well, he had seen the black and white movie with Patrick Stewart as Captain Ahab. And he was showing me how he had recurrent nightmares after seeing that movie of a great whale that was trying to eat him. And here's the sand play that he did. And you can see Captain Ahab, which I carved for him. You can see the little white uh, ivory leg um, depicted in the figure. And there's a figure trying to spear the, the great white whale, Moby Dick. This is the book, Spiritual Democracy, published in 2014. The Wisdom of Early American Visionaries for the Journey Forward. I have a section in there on William James. Uh, there's a marvelous foreword that was written by John Beebe, the author of Integrity and Depth. Now, this is a picture of Heart Lake with a view of Mount Shasta. After the book was published, I um, went for a camping trip. I took my tent and camped at about 7,000 feet up on Mount Shasta. And you can see Mount Shasta up there in, in its white glory. In the background, this is taken from uh, what's called Heart Lake above Castle Lake, where uh, I like to swim in the ice cold river. Uh, in the ice cold um, lake. And um, <clears throat> I had been there with my wife, Lori, and um, I had been um, Googling uh, on 
um, spiritual democracy to see what would come up. And I found um, that uh, the Vedant Vedantists were talking about Swami Vivekananda spiritual democracy. And I was very curious about him. And I had been going to the Vedanta uh, Center in San Francisco, which was founded by Vivekananda in uh, 1900. Not far from the Young Institute, in fact, uh, of San Francisco. And um, I had been writing a long manuscript on the collected writings of uh, Swami Vivekananda and his spiritual democracy. And I uh, went up in the late spring. It was a um, wonderful time. And um, on the way up the path to the lake where I had been, as I said, two young women approached me. They were both Indian. And um, they told me they were lost. And I said, well, where are you trying to go? I was about halfway up the trail now. And they said, we're looking for Hard Lake. I said, I know where that is. I've been there. I can show you where that is. And we had a marvelous time. We walked up to the lake together. And we began speaking about Swami Vivekananda. And as they told me, their grandfather had a picture of Vivekananda on the altar and that they had practiced pranayama for a while, which is a technique of breathing, but they had let it go, whereas I was, I was using it. And uh, <clears throat> as Vivekananda recommends, and here we were at that moment having a great time. We had a little lunch together and then we said goodbye. And um, they walked back down to the, uh, to the parking lot and I stayed up there and just bathed in the glory of this view and thought about the marvelous uh, coincidence of uh, that encounter. And that's the way synchronicity happens often through relationships. This is uh, Vivekananda. He talked at the Parliament of Religions in 1893 and was the star of the of the uh, of the Parliament. A young Hindu man for, at the age of 29 who stole the show and uh, talked about the unity of all religions, and um, he died in 1902 which is when James published the varieties of religious experience. And Jung was very aware of Vivekananda because he'd read uh, James's works, three of them at least. And um, <clears throat> James met him twice at Harvard University where he's a professor of psychology and philosophy. And I speak about this in my book. Now, in 2015, I went to the IAAP, IAJS uh, conference and delivered a paper on Jung's uh, spiritual democracy, which is now part of this new book. And I went to Sterling Memorial Library, and there's some nice doorways for you. Entering that library is like going into another century. It's a beautiful architectural structure. I also went to uh, the Yale Divinity School where Zurich analyst Murray Stein received his PhD. And uh, by coincidence, I began to meander through the hallways and I found these doorways. And it was at this time as I was writing in my journal that I came up with the idea of the doorways to the self. And um, look at this contrast. This is the doorways at Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, where I had been with my wife, Lori, I believe in 2007, while we were visiting Truchas, New Mexico, visiting a friend there. And um, the lighting here, I think I captured just right. It was just the, the right moment. This is an ancient Anasazi ceremonial uh, kiva. There's a picture of a kiva, Pueblo Bonita. 
And this is a, uh, a picture I took of Fajata Butte. Well, in 1977, a young woman was looking at petroglyphs and taking pictures and studying them, and she found a spiral sun symbol that showed that the ancient Anasazi had exact uh, ways to record the equinoxes and the solstice. And it's up on this butte that she found it. Now from 1969 to the present, I've had 14 significant vocational dreams about Emily Dickinson. I uh, dreamt in 2011, I was in a bookstore looking for what uh, ideas about what books could sell. And I had left Dickinson out of the book, Spiritual Democracy. She's mentioned, but not gone into in depth. And I realized, well, if we really want to have a representative, a female poet, in fact, the only poet who can stand shoulder to shoulder with Walt Whitman, I think we need needed a book on Emily Dickinson. And I had a manuscript that I'd been sitting on since 1995 when I uh, purchased that Taoist drum and uh, started to beat it. And I, um, I wrote this 70 page essay on Emily Dickinson and it was expertly edited by John Beebe. And um, that uh, essay became part of this book. Now, when I was uh, working on a poem, this is an 1885 poem that Emily sent to her friend in California, Helen Hunt Jackson, who was a great advocate of Native American people and their plight in the States. She sent a poem where she said, take all away from me and leave me ecstasy and I am richer than all my fellow men. Ill it behooveth me to dwell so wealthily when at my very door are those possessing more in abject poverty. Now I was in my, at my writing desk, uh, working all these things out when I was writing the manuscript. And uh, my wife, Lori, knew nothing about uh, this uh, poem because I hadn't been discussing the uh, origin or date of it with her. Uh, so during uh, the break uh, with all the writing, I, uh, I helped her paint the bathroom. And uh, right at that time, uh, she found a little purse um, that she had preserved, that she had kept. And she pulled it out and she showed me a bunch of coins in it. I said, what's that? And she said, that's that's a uh, coin that I don't know who gave it to me. And I said, Can, let me see it. That's a silver dollar. And I had always wanted a silver dollar as a boy and never, never had one. And this is a Morgan silver dollar. And you can see the E Pluribus Unum, 1885, which is exactly the same date as the poem I was analyzing and trying to uh, interpret from a Jungian analytic standpoint. And, uh, I had a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, she gave me the coin and it's only worth about $35 now. Um, it's not in mint condition, but it's a nice piece. And as Jung said, these things just happen. Now, here's a um, friend of mine, Neil Richardson. And I went to uh, Washington DC to do a book reading and you can see the book Emily Dickinson on the table. Neil uh, had me read to the Washington Friends of Walt Whitman. And out of that came this uh, synchronicity that I was invited to speak at the bicentennial of Walt Whitman's uh, birth uh, in um, uh, 2019 on June 1st, a day after Whitman's birthday, Memorial Day, the 31st of May. And I was in the National Cathedral and there I am at the front doors. My son, Emmanuel Herman, uh, took this photo of me before I gave my talk at the Bicentennial. Here's the Washington Cathedral. And there's a beautiful mandala there, a uh, stained glass window with the flags you can see. 
And now, um, as I mentioned, uh, I wrote my thesis on Meister Eckhart in 1980 and 81. Well, in Jung's memoir, he said, only in Meister Eckhart did I feel the breath of life. Did I feel the breath of life, you see? Well, there's, there's that breath of life again, Atma Victu, the breath of life. So somehow in Jung's reading of Eckhart, which started at the age of 15, and I do discuss this in my book on James and Jung, um, there was a, uh, an experience he had of something transcendent. This is the bell tower at Eckhart's church in Erfurt, the Prediger Kirche. This is the inside um, door, the doorway inside the church on the left side of the door. You can see the uh, seat where Meister Eckhart gave his sermons, uh, all in German here and Latin. I had about um, 15 dreams uh, involving Meister Eckhart but in a period of seven years. It's important when you uh, have these dreams to document them and write them down in your journal and preserve them because by meditating on them, eventually um, you began to get some insight into their meaning and what significance they hold for your life as a whole. Now I mentioned this chance meeting with Gabriella Eckhart out of the blue as an instance of synchronicity. As a, and as I say here, such experiences don't uh, fit neatly on any uh, bell curve. Hier wirkte Meister Eckhart um 1260 bis 1327 als Mönch und Prior del Domenico. Translated, here worked Meister Eckhart 1260 to 1327 as monk and prior of the Dominicans. There's the bell for you. I had a dream, uh, dream two that I recorded about Eckhart, about a bell that I had found that belonged to Meister Eckhart. And when I went to visit the church, uh, preacher's church, where he was the prior, uh, I saw this bell and it, it rang a bell, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I remembered my dream. And uh, these things are marvelous when they do happen to us. And uh, I also had a dream about the uh, Dominican theologian who I had read in 1981, uh, Matthew Fox, who's now an Anglican priest. Um, and uh, I just put this picture in here because I wanted you to see that uh, sometimes dreams do come true. And uh, Matthew graciously invited me to lead the dream group in the artist meditation section when he delivered some sermons in Eckhart's church. And that's why I went uh, right after I talked at the National Cathedral, right before the uh, Summer Solstice 2019. Here's the portal, the Meister Eckhart portal, this beautiful door. And there's the church. Here's the refectory. Well, by an interesting coincidence, meaningful to me, I worked as the head cook at the refectory steak and lobster house in Walnut Creek as a junior and senior in high school. I didn't even know what a refectory was. <laughs> and of course I hadn't read Eckhart, but when I went to that refectory, and it's a beautiful thing, um, I was reminded of my cooking experiences. There I am seated in Meister Eckhart's chair, still a bit jet lagged and looking a bit otherworldly. And here are my drums and uh, in closing, uh, I want to say the um, Jung Journal has graciously accepted my paper, um, The Hypothesis of Psychic Antibodies, <laughs> Antibodies, The Fight of the King Snake with the Rattlesnake. Well, the, the King Snake happens to be the natural predator 
an enemy of the rattlesnake and it can constrict and swallow rattlesnakes whole and they're immune to the poison of the rattlesnake. Um, I had another boy come into my practice who played this all out in his sand play. And in the uh, Jung journal, uh, you can uh, see a, a picture or two of that uh, sand play that the boy did and some read some of his narratives. And I just want to put in a plug for the Jung journal for those of you who don't subscribe to it. It's a marvelous uh, journal on culture and psyche. And, um, and thank you very much. Um, I've uh, enjoyed uh, this presentation and look forward to the next uh, part of our discussions and um, hear what you have to say. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Yeah, my Thank favorite. you. That was wonderful. Thanks. Just amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, I would just like to know more about the poem you quoted from Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could show us how it fits with the analytical psychology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. It's a poem that's been on my mind. Um, since I, I first read it in, uh, in 94, 95, um, after I finished my dissertation, I gave this poem uh, to my analyst at the time, Donald uh, Sandner. Um, and he, he was in love with the poem. He, he in fact, uh, as his wife told me, uh, after his untimely death from a heart attack at age 69, Don was reciting that poem as he was going over the Golden Gate Bridge uh, at sunset to her. And he had, uh, he had acknowledged that he had been discussing it with me. And um, she told me how important it was to him. One of the reasons for that is because um, as I say in the book, uh, Emily Dickinson was a medicine woman. Uh, she was in touch with the shamanic psyche, with the shamanic archetype and spoke directly out of that uh, deep uh, source of consciousness, uh, what Jung called the shamanic structures of consciousness. Um, in this sense, she was a poet shaman like Eberson and like Whitman and like Melville they're all, and, and Robinson Jeffers, they all share that in common. And that's why I have focused on this particular theme in my writings. The way in which she um, entered that was through uh, a verse technique. You know, she, she wasn't just speaking about some abstract concept. Um, as I show in my book, she said she, the lightning struck her every day. Uh, the cloud that through the instants slit and let the fire through the fire. She was in, her mind was on fire for a period of about a year when she wrote a poem every day. And if you look at her poetry, that's remarkable. Um, she was in touch with ecstasy and she was asked by Helen Hunt Jackson in 1885 if she would publish her poems. And by 1862 or so, she'd made a decision to forego publication because she said, publication is the auction of the mind of man. She said, success is counted sweetest by those who never succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires the sorest need. Dickinson was an ecstatic poet. She, she models this in so many of her poems and uh, I analyze a number of them. One of the reasons why is exactly uh, why, why you were making that uh, link to the brain is wider than the sky. She she had met Ralph Waldo Emerson. She she knew about uh, Alexander von Humboldt's book Cosmos, 
which Walt Whitman had on his writing desk. They were all writing out of this uh, source of inspiration by the great uh, Prussian polymath who had gone to South America and Central America and brought maps back to show Thomas Jefferson at the White House in 1804. Dickinson uh, was uh, a student at uh, Mount Holyoke uh, in 1848 during the Seneca Falls uh, Women's Rights Convention. Dickens is, our, I think, our greatest female national poet. And one of the reasons is because she said in a letter to her mentor, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who commanded a regiment of black soldiers during the Civil War. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. Now that's, that's coming from a pure experience. She was in touch with some energies that um, can take the top of our heads off too, if we read her uh, deeply. Um, and she talked about it as um, being scalped by the divine uh, Indian who walks across the, the sky with moccasins, the, the electric moccasin. She was struck by the electric moccasin again and again from the timeless dimension. So I don't know if that helps you. The, the, um, the poem, just in concrete uh, terms, was sent to Helen as if to tell her take all away from me, but leave me ecstasy. I, 1885, she was a year from her death. She died at the age of 55, 56, I think 55. So this was right before her death. She was very close to death at the time. She was suffering from Bright's disease and was in a lot of agony, physical agony. So part of the, the way that she uh, expressed herself to Helen was out of this, see ecstasy is not just bliss, it's, it's also connected to pain and agony. And um, so she was very close to the emotional center of the self that Jung talked about. Um, she didn't get torn apart by it because she had images, she had symbols. She's one of the greatest uh, metaphorical, uh, lyrical poets of all time. And she had an integrity. Take all away from me, but leave me ecstasy. She also said, uh, she talked about in integrity. Her integrity was that she wouldn't compromise her style for the contemporary uh, rhyme and meter of her day. She wrote authentically out of the self. And in that sense, she's one of our great examples of a female poet who can inspire women and men during uh, a time when we really need a, a female voice to help empower uh, the feminine in men, and women, the feminine in, in females. This, this, in this sense, and she, she's very, uh, I call her bioerotic, uh, I use that term. That's a current term I coined, like Whitman, like Melville. She was in touch with the transcendent uh, uh, sense of self that really pre, uh, it's a forerunner to um, a lot of the gender uh, discussions that we're hearing these days. Uh, uh, the fluidity, she had that. She had that. And um, I think what she was saying is she had a connection to ecstasy and she didn't need anything else from the world. She had poverty of spirit, as Eckhart taught. And um, uh, 
some keep the Sabbath going to church. Uh, I keep it staying at home. You see, her her writing desk, her room where she she wrote her her poems was her um, was her alchemical forge. That's where she forged the signature of her own authentic identity. Um, yeah, I'll never forget when I first stepped foot into John Beebe's office, he um, was going to edit that paper. Don Sender sent me to John to have the uh, essay edited. And the first thing uh, John did when I sat down was he closed his eyes and he went into a reverie and he recited the poem by, by memory because he had been to Harvard and studied American literature and poetry. Uh, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. I, of course, had read that one, but then he uh, recited a second one. Um, Dare see a soul at the white heat? then crouch within the door. I mean, this is really uh, alchemical stuff and it's very, uh, very Jungian in a sense. It's, it's very rich with Jungian motifs and, and metaphors. So um, thank you for your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there. I actually have a question, if I may. Yes. You may. Uh, my name is JP. Thank you, Stephen, for the presentation and for other people who have uh, helped organize this. I'm not familiar with the organization, but now I am. Um, <clears throat> given my age, which is 28, I'm very much interested in vocational dreams. I don't yet have a livelihood or a particular profession that I feel established in. Mm -hmm. And my question is simply, are there very particular symbols or images in the dream life that Mm -hmm. one should try to specifically look out for when trying to de determine what type of um, vocational energies or symbols or images might be trying to come through. Like, are there very specific ones that are, are typical and come up often for people? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, JP. That's a really good question. And uh, I'm uh, writing a manuscript right now on vocational dreams. Um, and uh, what I would say to that is um, the, the archetypes of vocation, and I, I use a plural there because um, there are many archetypes of vocation, and we have uh, a plurality of callings in life. In other words, we don't just dream about a job or a, uh, a single career but we go through changes. And at 28, that's the, the uh, age at which Emily Dickinson, in fact, began to really uh, heat up with her uh, poetry and began turning out, you know, poems uh, that are 28. Uh, Melville, uh, Whitman, the, the, you're at a very significant uh, life stage. Um, and uh, be open to um, dreams in particular uh, that have symbols that relate, to, that connect you to um, interests that may have been active in your childhood. Um, that's a motif that we saw in Jung's uh, example. I'm aware of it in myself. I used to catch those king snakes in the hills. I've, I've had hundreds of dreams with king snakes because as a boy of seven, I uh, came upon a pair of mating king snakes entwined in a long embrace. This was a mating pair. And I'll never forget that. Um, it uh, was an image that just stayed there. And uh, so animals can be, uh, that you know the native americans teach us that the totem animal is often there in vision quest um uh literature of the plains indians uh the young man at uh, uh adolescence or later uh, goes on a vision quest and um, 
So I would, I would say um, that this is a time for you uh, of, of questing. You're on a quest for your uh, vocational dream or vocational symbols. And they will come if you make a careful record of your dreams and, uh, and deepen the work through, um, uh, through work. Now, another uh, example of a, a vocational dream would be a mentor figure. Um, the, the, I've had uh, numerous dreams about Everson for example, um, uh, you, uh, you can cultivate these dreams too through dream incubation. You can tell yourself before you go to sleep at night, I'm gonna remember my dreams and put your iPhone or your dream journal by your bed and wake up when you have the dream. If you don't write them down, we, we lose them. It's like a fish, if you try to grab it by the tail, it's gonna slip back in the water. So, um, uh, also, uh, what I was saying uh, uh, about the inferior function, if you know what your psychological type is, and uh, I notice Adam Frey is here, he's also uh, uh, quite, uh, quite, a, quite versed in, in, in psychological types, you, you can... <clears throat> You can use uh, that access, that doorway through your inferior function to, to try and connect with what Jung called the deeper layers of the unconscious, the collective unconscious, where these dreams sometimes come from. But on the personal level, they can manifest themselves as uh, figures in your personal life, uh, people you have met or know, or a transpersonal figure. For example, you can read a book and then dream about uh, that figure. That person can become a kind of a, a, a transpersonal mentor figure for you in a dream. Um, but the important thing I think uh, is to um, be open to whatever uh, uh, manifestation of uh, a calling dream wants to come to you. Um, and sometimes uh, these uh, big dreams come during moments of crisis. And that's why uh, being in psychotherapy or an analysis can go a long way in helping a person open up to uh, the unconscious and, um, and then making a study of uh, these dreams. So. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh, I, I have a, a comment. Yes. Um, I, well, I think the last person who was talking to, I don't know his name, to JPM or something, mm -hmm. um, he's in a Saturn return at 28. Mm -hmm. I think that's very uh, important for his life right now to explore that um but my my question is you you were saying in the very beginning you were talking about um defining what prana was yeah or, could you and i think i might have missed it but i think um you were using it as as god right well prana is, is i was the, quoting from the upanishads um yeah, and but in, in the Upanishads, prana is Brahman. Prama, uh, prana right. is the is the universal essence uh, that permeates through everything. And so, right. I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, it just that I think I think it. Uh, I I don't know if I missed you saying this, but um, whatever the universe, I call it God. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also breath. And so putting yeah. those things together, I don't know that you mentioned that that actually equals breath. And it, for me, it was for the first time I kind of heard it with a aha. Uh, those two well, together. I, I, you, did, I did mention it in passing and I probably could have uh, spent more time um, uh, with that. But that's exactly the link that I'm glad you made because that's that's what I wanted to convey uh, about the synchronicity of the um, 
two pandemics and Jung's stone carving and the breath of life. And Jung was studying the Upanishads, in fact, in psychological types in 1921. He has a long uh, chapter on the texts of India, you know, the Upanishads, the uh, he was reading these texts and you can see the Sanskrit uh, terms in his red book that uh, Jung was very aware of um, the significance of prana. So, but the unconscious gave the uh, term, the breath of life. And he, he mentioned that only in Meister Eckhart did I feel it, the breath of life. Uh, well, that, that is, that is a, a metaphor uh, for what, you know, the, the Hindus, uh, the Vedantas call prana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for that. Did you have another connection? Uh, no. you, you, you get an interesting connection to astrology. And, and that, of course, is uh, something that uh, is very uh, connected to this, uh, to this link, too, of vocational dreams and synchronicity. Mm -hmm. I, I I loved everything that you said. It was really, really wonderful. I'm going to go get a, a Dickinson book now. <laughs> I have no idea. She's so bhakti. Um, and the other thing was that you were talking about Vivekananda, but you never mentioned Ramakrishna. Well, uh, Vivekananda was sent uh, to America by uh, Ramakrishna's wife, uh, um, and um, the mother, and to, to speak at the parliament. Um, of course, Ramakrishna was uh, the great master of, of Swami Vivekananda. And um, it's from uh, Ramakrishna that, uh, that Vivekananda learned how to breathe and to, to enter samadhi, uh, a state of mind that uh, uh, is called uh, Satchitananda or consciousness being and bliss mm -hmm. Ramakrishna lived in that in that uh, realm and um, he in fact had a vocational dream about Vivekananda before he met him Ramakrishna did which is a very interesting story uh, that I, I don't think we have time for here but uh, I do tell I do talk about that back in November we need a speaker <laughs> yeah. Yes, hello. <laughs> we have another question here. Thank you. You're welcome. Um I was going to ask you to shed some light in regards to vocation and the wounded healer concept of it is a vocation that comes up a lot with healers and analysts or mm -hmm. psychologists uh, yep. or great. doctors even. So great. I was wondering. Great, great, great question. Well, in my master's thesis uh, research, I interviewed 10 people and I was 28, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, when I started writing that uh, thesis. Um, who had a vocational dream in early adulthood. Now, what I came up with in my research was that in every case, there was a connection between the vocational interest or choice and childhood wounds, some kind of uh, wounding events in, in latency or early childhood. Um, and uh, only a couple of the um, people I interviewed were healers uh, or um, uh, now, of course, I'm quite familiar with this, uh, both from experience as well as through my analytic work. And I see this, uh, um, this uh, correlation, as Jung would say, the correlation uh, uh, quite frequently, um, that um, it's often out of a, uh, a wound. And the shaman writes out of a wound, you see. And oftentimes people who undergo a very deep uh, regression and analysis will, will get in touch with these, um, these, these uh, healer, uh, wounded healer uh, 
uh, dreams. And uh, this is a good, um, this is a very important um, uh, connection you're making um, to the, the, the vocational dream that um, uh, I haven't published my thesis yet, um, but uh, perhaps will one day, but that's, that's the variable that emerged. And it's out of that that I wrote my book, my uh, dissertation, uh, Vocational Dreams in Childhood, because it's in childhood that I think that these dreams first begin to emerge or vocational interests do. And the, the children I was working with and who I uh, interviewed, well, they were my patients. Uh, four of them, the subjects of my study, were boys in residential treatment who were severely emotionally disturbed, SED. Each one had some kind of a, an emotional wound from very early uh, childhood or trauma, severe trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, in uh, a couple of the cases, um, uh, you could see this connection uh, directly uh, between a future occupational choice or career and um, now I distinguish between vocation and career. Uh, a uh -huh. Career is the impact of your vocation on the world. Whereas the calling, the vocation, the vocatus, as Jung used the Latin, is really where your motivation lies, what you're motivated to do most. Uh, so someone can have a job and uh, like, for example, when I was doing my master's thesis research, I was working in uh, the restaurant as a line cook. And I uh, decided to interview some of the waitresses and waiters and a, and a cook as the research subjects. And not one of them wanted to be doing the work they were doing. They were, they were making money. They wanted to be doing something else. And that's where these dreams would come up as compensatory. Jung also, also used the words compensatory dreams or teleological dreams. They point toward the future. So, uh, so you can have a dream that doesn't really come into manifestation in a practical way, sometimes tw until 20 years later. And that's why I think it's so valuable to keep your journal because you can go back and read them. And that, that way you get some distance, some objectivity, what Jung called uh, psychic objectivity. And he learned this from William James and from Theodore Flournoy. The concept of detachment from the emotional object, uh, the ability to uh, reflect um, from what he called the transcendent function. You see, this is also part of uh, Jung's meditations on psychological type is this idea of a transcendent function that it is made up of many functions. Uh, the ability to hold uh, a larger breadth of um, patterns of and energies of psychological type to borrow uh, the title of uh, John Beebe's new book. Um, the the vocational dreams come out of this deep foundation with messages for the conscious mind. And, and sometimes they, they emerge in what William James called a, um, a transmarginal field, which is a field between. It's, it's uh, like you're mentioning the analytic relationship between a patient and a therapist or an analyst, there's a field in between. Jung said oftentimes we dream, we, we don't dream, we dream out of what's between ourselves and a patient. So if we're working with a patient and the patient's looking for a vocational dream, something can happen, something can emerge uh, that, uh, it turns on a light bulb and helps uh, illuminate uh, the path ahead. And oftentimes this comes from a dream, like Jung's great dream of Philemon. You know, that was a, a turning point for Jung. A great, great vocational dream. I didn't mention, by the way, he had an earlier dream, which is when he was at the University of Basel and he was trying to decide, well, what was he going to study? Philology? Yeah. Right, and he had a dream about a, a radiolarian in a in a 
in a wood uh, and it was shimmering in a pool with opalescent hues. And uh, he knew like that in an instant, natural science. Now, psychology as a natural science begins with William James. It begins in America. It begins with James's principles of psychology in 1890. And Jung read that for his, before he wrote his dissertation. So to look at dreams as facts, this is very pragmatic. This is pragmatism. This is very Jamesian. Jung was, Jung was more influenced by James than most people know because that chapter has been missing. And so we have a, what Sham Dasani calls a Freudocentric view of, of Jung because you have the chapter on Freud and then the confrontation with the unconscious and then this missing piece in between, which was Flournoy and James. So anyway, uh, I, I, uh, I think your connection is spot on. I think you're right um, to, to uh, make that connection. Thank you. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Thank you, Stephen. Um, Shirley. Shirley, hi. Hi. Um, I was really taken with what you shared with us today because of the broad scope. Mm -hmm. When I read the title of vocation, being retired as I am, mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, this will be interesting. But I, I was thinking of it in terms of past. Mm -hmm. And your presentation shows so much that vocation continues and is present. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you. Up, I, to, the, up to the last breath, uh, <laughs> like the example of Emily Dickinson. You know? Yeah. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, these vocational dreams continue to happen uh, during life transitions. So there are many transitions in life. And so the, the transition from midlife to old age also has a, uh, a big role to play. And uh, I learned this uh, particularly from my uh, review of Murray Stein's uh, very fine book, uh, Transformation, where he, he looks at the the big changes that occurred in, in artists, uh, such as Rembrandt and uh, these old uh, self-portraits uh, from a la very late stage of life looking, and, and you see the changes that the personality went through. Um, The, the most important uh, essay to read for those interested in vocation is Jung's uh, 1930, uh, 31 or 32 essay, uh, The Development of the Personality. It's in volume 17 of the Collected Works. And there he says that um, uh, uh, vocation is a... Um, It's what cures a neurosis. You see, it's, it's what helps us get out of the neurotic condition from the complexes that ail us from our childhood to get back to the former question about wounds and uh, analytic work. You see, Jung knew this um, and made a, a, a wonderful uh, gave a wonderful talk to the Kulturbund um, and uh, explained uh, that, you know, vocation comes from the Latin root uh, vocare, as Everson said, to be called by a voice. It's an inner voice that speaks to us. Jung speaks about vocation as an actual voice, such as the voice of Philemon that spoke to him directly. It's a real presence, as William James said, uh, that, that one can uh, dialogue uh, with when, when the, the vocational figure appears, the great master. Jung said that Philemon was what the Indians call a guru. Jung didn't need a guru when he went to India. He didn't see, uh, he didn't go see the uh, Maharishi or uh, Sri Aurobindo because he felt that he, he had already an inner connection to, to the self and um, he didn't need to be enlightened. 
by an outer teacher. He had the inner teacher. And I, we all have that within us. And Jung, of course, uh, shows us this and shows us the way. And I think more could be um, researched into this interesting connection that, um, that I was trying to make between the body and the, you know, particularly for an intuitive type like Jung was, uh, introverted intuitive, that that extroverted sensation was the spine that connected him to the to the door, the doorway that opened to the foundation, what he called the psychoid realm of the of the unconscious, which is uh, only psyche-like because it it contains the whole cosmos. It's it's not just something, and that's why the transformative relationships in our life, what Murray Stein calls transformative relationships, these are the uh, mentor figures that come to us, and. Um, create what uh, he calls metamorphosis. Uh, and sometimes it can happen very rapidly, like a, uh, a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis, from the caterpillar to a, a chrysalis, to a, a full mature butterfly. Um, and, and this goes on. It goes on till the, the end of life, until our last breath. So thank you, Shirley. Thank for, you. Yeah. I have a question that did the reason that Jung, uh, his experience with India, I mm -hmm. think, I think it wasn't a great one. I'm not sure. Oh, it was transformative uh, for Jung. Uh, it was transformative because he went to India, as he said, to, to try and solve this problem of evil, you see. And when he went to the Kali temple in Calcutta, where Ramakrishna had his great uh, experience of samadhi. He saw the blood of animals splattered on the walls. And uh, as uh, the story goes, uh, he was having uh, hallucinations because he caught a, a bad virus in India. Jung didn't want to get inoculated before he left. He didn't want to get a, uh, a shot and wanted to be open to experiences. And he got very ill and um, he was having visions of, of red he, uh, in, the, in the hospital. And um, he, had a, he had a big dream, a vocational dream uh, uh, after he, he got out of the hospital uh, about the grail and that he had to swim across a, a body of water to uh, bring the grail, the, the holy grail to, you see, Jung's foundation in Switzerland was Judeo-Christian and he felt it was very important for him, for his personal myth, to return to his roots. And um, this uh, may have uh, biased him somewhat towards uh, towards yoga and Indian spirituality. And there's been some marvelous books written about this recently. And I, I have a chapter on uh, James and Vivekananda and Jung in India in the new book. Um, but um, as I've heard from people who've, who've read Jung's uh, essays uh, about uh, uh, the psychology of the East, um, those cautionary words, I think, are are um, are also helpful because um, active imagination, as Jung taught it, is it's Jung's own method. He discovered this. People were using it before, but Jung refined it in his own way and taught it in his own way, and. Um, Well, thank you for your comments, and uh, I, I, uh, I'll leave it there for now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you want to know more about India, Jung and India. Well, there's, like I said, there's two great books right now, uh, Jung and India and Jung in India. Great. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can Google, Google them. They'll come up. Um, they're, they're, I recommend both of them. Okay. Uh, do you think it had anything to do with his 
um, I, I don't know how, how much he could surrender. Well, Jung, Jung, no, no, Jung, Jung had a real vocation to this. Uh, at the age of five, his mother gave him uh, a book called the Orbis Pictus. This was a, uh, a book uh, with pictures of Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Krishna. And uh, uh, already at the age of five, Jung had a curiosity about these uh, figures from the Orient, these God images. Uh, very interesting when you think about a vocation because Jung had many vocations. One of them was to write about India, and he had his own particular contribution. And uh, I think his works deserve to be read. Mm -hmm. So any other questions from the... Uh, I, I, ju I just would like to make a comment. Please. Uh -huh. exactly. uh, when you're explaining your journey, and um, one thing caught my attention then, when you said, I think you were in high school cooking in that place. Well, the, that the, the refectory. <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, he was already doing alchemy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know it at the time. I, 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 I discovered Young at 19, I believe. Uh, my mother gave me a copy of Man and His Symbols, and oh. I, that was it. <laughs> the cooking is something. That's a, an amazing yeah. experience. No, no, I, I still cook today. I, I, I cook... Uh, and uh, I spent 10 years in, in some very good restaurants as a, as a line cook. Uh, worked in the fish station oftentimes and learned French, French cuisine and California. I worked at the California Cafe. And when fish. I, what's that? The unconscious. And fish, you're saying? Fish, yeah. The unconscious. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's right. all the connection there. Right, I right. How yeah. I was yeah. so, I'm so... Um, touched by the oh. many synchronicities that you brought. Well, thank and, you. Uh, speech, speech that you had to Amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. And your, your name is? Rosalie. Oh, you're Rosalie. Hello, Rosalie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm you're finishing in, uh, you're in, my doctorate degree in, at Pacifica in clinical psychology, yes. and I study yeah. young. You're now in New Mexico, is that correct? I live here and I came here to do uh, the analytical training program. Right. But, you know, dreams and all of that mm -hmm. turn out for me to go to Pacifica instead. Yeah. So, yeah. And I did study Jung in Brazil. I am from Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm a clinical psychologist licensed from Brazil, you know, for 22 years. But here in the United States, I had to do many things again mm -hmm. in order to get licensed here. So, but I, I love and I really appreciate your. Uh, well, your thank view. you. You probably bring a lot of richness from your own experiences in uh, Brazil growing up. I do, I do. Thank yeah. you. I'm I'm here like very very thrilled with your. Um, yeah. Yeah. Moved with your uh, experience and sharing here. Oh my God. Yeah, as we're talking about the importance of breath and today we finally got a little clearing. Uh, can't quite see the sun, but it's, it's better. And yeah. uh, so sad. I, I know that the Amazon has been uh, yes. in crisis. Yes. Um, with this new government, it's so sad. Mm -hmm. And the tribes, and yeah, it, it's a lot going on in the world, I think, right now. Yeah, yeah. Not just there, not just here. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're all in pain, collective pain, right? We're, we're all in this together, yeah. Yeah, Thank we you. are. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Just to go more towards a, a definition of what you would call vocation. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said earlier that it doesn't really mean career. Well, and, mm -hmm. and just to, to say where I'm going, I, I often hope for, if I'm in the middle of some kind of intense conflict, mm -hmm. I hope for some dream to clear it up. But mm -hmm. I never really get a dream that says, okay, here's your conflict and here's how you solve it. Mm -hmm. The dream is usually completely unrelated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and I've begun to think well I should just be looking in a different direction away from the conflict itself mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. 
your comments, please. Good question, Stephen. Um, the, of course, a career is also deeply connected to the vocational foundation of the personality. And uh, the hope is that the two are going to coincide in such a way that one can achieve success in one's life through a career, a successful career, because of the fact that one is throughout one's uh, efforts to uh, wrestle with conflict, wrestle with the conflict of the opposites and engage in a dialogue with the, the unconscious or the subconscious mind as William James said. One then can connect with the streams of consciousness that are already there in the unconscious. This is a term from William James too, the streams of consciousness. There are streams of consciousness going on all the time, but we don't pay attention and we don't have techniques in order to make those um, streams of consciousness self-aware in us. So we need method. We need a technique to, uh, as Jung said, find a way to make the unconscious conscious. Within all of us, there is a sense of knowing, a sense of knowledge about what our vocation really is, but how to tap into that, how to know what that is. This requires a certain amount of um, letting go. You know, Jung said uh, in his uh, introduction to the secret of the golden flower, which I showed an image of, you know, the, the mandala he painted at that time when he got Richard Wilhelm's uh, manuscript. In that introduction, Jung says, um, letting go of oneself, action through non-action, as taught by Meister Eckhart, became for me the key that opened the door to the way. So he says, we must be able to let things happen. So if I'm out uh, looking for stones and uh, uh, I just let go, uh, and you know, I maybe find uh, you know some stone um, because the stone, as Jung said, is a symbol for the self. It's the alchemical symbol for the lapis philosophorum, the the philosopher's stone. Sometimes a lucky hunch or an idea can come to us, or it can come through an outer relationship. So, suddenly, there's a laying on of hands by a master spirit, as Everson says. And this happened to Everson. He was in the library at Sonoma, uh, at uh, Fresno State University, studying uh, literature. And he pulled a book off the shelf by Robinson Jeffers and sat down in the library to read it. And one could be down in a basement in Berkeley Library at the Bancroft and have the same experience. And suddenly he had this intuition, you could call it, the sense of knowing that he was going to leave school and become the poet of the San Joaquin, a nature poet, because Jeffers, the lines in Jeffers poetry were so powerful that as Dickinson said, they took the top of his head off and he was scalped suddenly. He had a, a what James calls a religious experience. And oftentimes it comes this way with vocational dreams, that it's a, a, an experience of what Jung called the numinous. So the conflict, engaging in the conflict is good because then we wrestle with the opposites. Then we're in the, the process of the beginning to dialogue with the unconscious in the hope that something's going to emerge out of it. And... And that's what would happen in this course, Birth of a Poet. And I would read 50 dream journals each quarter. And, 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 and this, every student kept a dream journal. 
and recorded their dreams and looked to the dreams for vocational guidance. And it was really interesting to see some of these students change their majors in the middle of their career, uh, academic career. And I was actually warned by the, um, uh, by the dean of Cal College, if you do that, you're gonna, set, you're gonna destroy your career as a, uh, as, a, as a psychology professor. And I said, well, so be it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> here, I am, here I am with you teaching this course today. So, Thanks. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, stay with it. Stay with the conflict. You know, Jung says it's out of conflict and chaos that the. Uh, that the alchemical work really begins to happen. And so, uh, yeah, and, and you know, these conflicts uh, don't stop in our lives. We have, I mean, just learning how to use a Zoom, which you taught me how to use, <laughs> was a bit of a conflict for me. So thank you for your instruction. <laughs> You're quite well. <laughs> Uh, hardly the laying on of hands of a master, but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Absolutely. another question? Yes. If, if there is time? There is plenty yes. of time. Thank you. Um, it, the question may come off as a little bit sarcastic, but I do not, or ironic, but I do not mean it in this spirit. Okay. Um, when you were talking about vocation, I, I think you were... Uh, referencing um, spiritual vocations. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, when you were teaching back then and looking at vocational dreams, did anyone end up becoming an accountant or a plumber um, or um, a cook and so, and, and so on? There was a young man in the course who was studying in the natural sciences and he had seven dreams across the course of a quarter that he was gonna go to the Sierras and become a park ranger like in the following John Muir, he, be, he became a park ranger. One of the, um, he, he left the, 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 um, the school and became a park ranger. Um, another young man uh, who was a cook at the, um, uh, the Walnut Creek train station where I was a line cook when I was doing my interviews for my master's thesis. He had a dream that um, uh, he wanted, to, he was going to go be a park ranger up on Mount Diablo. Why? Because that's where they had taken his mother's ashes after she died. So this connection between a childhood wound and vocational uh, choice, it doesn't have to be something spiritual, something great. Of course, you know, John Muir was very much in touch with the spiritual uh, uh, vocation, uh, although it was very pantheistic. It wasn't, there's no creed involved in any of that. It was, uh, you know, the Yosemite and the Hetch Hetchy was his cathedral. He said, damn the Hetch Hetchy, you might as well damn the cathedrals for no greater cathedral ever existed in the mind of man. Well, you know, the, um, the, the vocation to be a chef, for example, I, I, I knew several chefs in my experience and they were really in their true vocation. Uh, I was not called to be a chef. I, I knew it. I, I, I knew I was doing it as a job and because I had talent. There's some difference between talent and where your gifts lie, you see. I didn't have so many gifts as a, as a line cook. I was good and I was fast. I would put out 400 dinners a night sometimes and as the head cook of the refectory. And, um, but you know, that, that was just part of, uh, you know, it was a vocation. It was at the time, but it was not what I was going to do for the rest of my life. In fact, if it had, I think I, my soul would have been destroyed. There wasn't enough room to breathe, you know, to use the breath metaphor again and expand and, and become more fully myself, more embodied too. 
because it's very difficult work. It's very, very uh, pressured and, you know, you got to get those meals perfect. And uh, it's not about perfection for me, you know, um, and it wasn't for Jung. Um, but it's a very good question and a comment, and I don't think it's sarcastic at all. And I think- Thank it, you. Okay. I had a question also. Yes. Um, when, you, when you were mentioning about the inner voice, and I was yes. thinking of the inner ally, and yes. also like an accompanying presence, which of course could be interior, Mm -hmm. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there's the archetype of the guardian angel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that each person has his or her own. Uh, is that something you would find in Jung also? Oh, yes. In Jung's, um, Jung's writing in Psychotherapists and the Clergy, um, he talked about the confessional. Uh, he talked about the importance of, you see, Jung was a very close colleague of Victor White, who was Everson's uh, spiritual um, mentor at uh, St. Albert's here in Oakland, <clears throat> uh, at the Oakland Dominican Priory for 18 years. He was a lay monk and he learned a lot from White, who learned directly from Jung, you see, about the importance of um, of, well, just last night, I was looking at that wonderful uh, special on CNN about uh, Joe Biden. I had no idea uh, about his history. It was a wonderful uh, show. And he pulled out his rosary and talked about, you know, the pain of he went through. And you could see the faith in him. Um, yes, absolutely. You see Dickinson, who you're interested in, uh, while she was at Mount Holyoke, you know, she came from a Trinitarian background. And uh, there were Unitarian influences on her writings, of course, uh, through Ralph Waldo Emerson. But um, Dickinson was a post-Christian poet. Like Jung was a, you could say, post-Christian uh, myth maker. His myth of meaning is very deeply rooted in the Judeo-Christian foundation. Just read Answer the Job. Um, the inner voice is the voice that speaks to us through a conscience. Read Jung's paper, A Psychological View of Conscience, and you'll see what I mean. In that paper, Jung makes the link, the direct link between the voice, the inner voice, and the um, vox dei, the voice of God. You see, if you read memories, you'll see there's no, it's beautifully uh, conceived. There's no uh, distinction between the inner voice and God for Jung. Although he said, you know, he um, was not a theologian. Jung was very well read in theology, extremely well read, the son of a parson. You know, his father was part of the Swiss Reformed Church. And uh, you know, his, uh, his grandfather was baptized by Schleiermacher, the great uh, writer on, uh, on religion who was Catholic. Baptized, you see, his grandfather was Catholic. And before he became a doctor. All these influences, the grandfather, the great grandfather, these are ancestral figures. The great grandmother, the grandmother. They also can appear in our dreams as vocational allies or symbols. But you're talking about the ally in an, an, in an objective sense uh, as the, uh, the inner guide of the soul. Yes, I think there's a direct link between uh, shamanism and the ally in shamanism and the uh, guardian angel. Dickinson had her guardian angels. I, Everson, I used to sit in office with him. He'd be in prayer. He was a Catholic to the end of his day. Um, so, um, the, there was a sense of sanctity around him. 
because he had, he was a man of, of faith. Yes, he left the church, but he always, and he was a poet shaman, but he, he, uh, as he said, um, but he maintained his adhesion to uh, his Dominican background, um, his conversion experience. First, first conversion was Robinson Jeffers. Second conversion was through Mary Fabili, who led him into the uh, Catholic Church. So a woman can lead a man into his calling. And in that sense, it happened through an outer relationship. She opened the doorway for Everson to a whole new reality. He was the greatest Catholic poet of the 20th century, uh, next to Thomas Merton. Um, and was quite famous as a Dominican uh, poet. When he, when he left the order and became William Everson, it was difficult for him to sell his books. Uh, so he underwent a sacrifice of his career, you could say, as a Catholic poet, but he maintained that line of connection to the self, to his guardian angel, which was always for him the connection to nature. And he got that from Jeffers. Jeffers was the voice when you, the giant hand of Robinson Jeffers, you know, it grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and, and pulled him out of academia. And then he parachuted back in at UC Santa Cruz as William Everson again later. And that's how I knew him. He taught that course for 10 years and I was his last TA be, before he left. Uh, uh, to uh, pursue his writings, nature writings. Anyway, I, I hope I um, answered that to your satisfaction. The guardian angel and the ally is a very interesting uh, link. I, I hadn't thought, thought of that, but I like it. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to ask another one? Of course. Thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about type and um, MBTI is one of the most prevalent tools that career counselors use. Yes, um, and I was wondering if you could just comment on that. Well, I'd be happy to. Um, I used to teach uh, at the career development program at John F. Kennedy University uh, from 1989 to 1994. Uh, I taught the career counselors there, um, and a lot of my courses uh, focused on vocational dreams, but uh, the, the Myers-Briggs type indicator was uh, something that was of great interest to the career counselors, because of course they were all using it as a measure of um, uh, career interests in working with um, uh, clients um, in career counseling. Of course, I'm not a career counselor, I, I'm a marriage and family therapist, but I was teaching them. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, as, an, as an MFT, and there was a, there was a very interesting uh, um, question about that. And uh, I gave a, a talk on the inferior function, uh, which, uh, which I preserved and I have it. Um, uh, I think the person to ask about this would be, and he's in this group, is Adam Frey. I think he uses the MBTI, and um, and I think he teaches it. I'm no longer teaching the MB, uh, Myers-Briggs, although I, I recommend it to all my patients. Um, and of course, I gain a great deal of uh, information about people from the test, you know based on your type. So, you know, if, if you tell me your type, then that helps me think about uh, the problem of vocation in a different way, you see, because um, every personality type uh, has a certain configuration and the, 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 the functions of consciousness vary and um, so I can use my own knowledge um, that I've gained through reading Jung and, of course, a lot of the literature on types, and especially John B.B., his new book. Um, 
So I would recommend to everybody in this group, if you haven't taken the Myers-Briggs or the Kiersey and Bates temperament sorter, which is just as statistically reliable, I, I think. Now, someone else might tell me that's not true, but uh, I've seen the results from that test yield the same kinds of um, results. Um, and you can take the test at the back of that little book, uh, Please Understand Me, which is in its second edition now. Um, so I think that this is really at the cutting edge of um, research in analytical psychology that needs to be furthered. And I think your question is a very good one. And uh, I encourage you to look into this uh, more deeply because it's, uh, it's certainly been uh, one of my interests for a long time, but I, I can't say I'm an expert on the Myers-Briggs. I, I won't put myself out in that way, but there are people who are, who you could refer to uh, to help you better understand this question. You're welcome. I, I have a comment. Um, yes. As a vocational rehabilitation counselor, when I worked for State of California, oh, really? it was my first career uh, position when uh, out of psychology department. Uh, and I was given a caseload of 200 people where wow. we assessed, yeah, where we assessed the individual's disability mm. and what hindered them from being functionally mm -hmm. productive in, in culture and society as an earning an income. This mm -hmm. vocational calling that is linked with earning a living. Yes. Uh, and is very important for young people. Yes. Understand, mm -hmm. as you were saying, there's a difference between vocation and career. So what you do, what what you do with your skills. Um, Hi. Can you can you repeat the name of that paper again? Adaptation. Oh, uh, it's in I believe it's in volume 18 of the collected works. Um, Young wrote it in uh, 1916 when he was uh, working on the Red Book. And he put it in a desk drawer and it wasn't published till uh, after his death, I believe. Uh, adaptation, individuation and collectivity. And uh, I, uh, I do a review of that in my new book. Um, I think I have a, a section in one of the chapters on that paper because I, I think it's so important. And the reason is because he talks about uh, the, the two destinies, you see that we have two destinies, you know, the destiny to the inner life and the destiny to the outer life. You see this whole idea that we are just one type that we're introverted or extroverted is not, is not accurate. We are wholeness means a combination of these functions you see. And uh, uh, what we uh, owe to those who we are away from during individuation, which requires a withdrawal from the world, is as Jung says, works with individual stamp. So when he emerged from the Red Book period and he began writing two essays on analytical psychology and then psychological types, you see, and Instinct and the Unconscious, these papers he wrote in 1919, what we owe is out of our guilt for individuation, for being away from the world, because individuation requires solitude and inner work. What we owe is something to society, you see. And in the Red Book, he talks about what we owe to the dead, to the ancestors, to our, our, our great grandparents or ancestors we never met or even heard about. Or it could be the Black Elk's great vision of the grandfathers, the seven, the six grandfathers who came to him in the rainbow teepee and initiated him at the age of nine, the age of nine, he had a vocation as, to be a, a shaman for the culture, for the great Sioux, Oglala Sioux people before the little, the battle of the little bighorn. He had this, this tremendous vision uh, at, at that young age in latency. 
So I've made this connection and I, I analyzed that vision in that paper I wrote in 1979 on vocation, which Everson loved. He gave me a glowing evaluation um, as an example of a vocational dream. Um, anyway, that's the title of the, I, I know I uh, got away from your question, which was very concrete and specific. It's, it's uh, that paper. And I believe it's in volume 18, Stephen. Uh, well, you expanded on a very question, <laughs> so uh, no, no apology necessary. Uh, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, do, if if uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, uh, Steve. Yes, yes, David. I just wanted to mention that I just sent a chat. Uh, with a quote from Jung on vocation, just in case anybody's oh. interested. Yes, you did. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is it then that inexorably tips the scales in favor of the extraordinary? It is what is commonly <sighs> called vocation, an irrational factor that destines a man to a emancipate himself from the herd, from his well-worn paths. True personality is always a calling from which there is no escape. Uh -huh. See, like the personality of your true self, that's a vocation. Wow, from which there is no escape. Yeah. Yes. That's wow. something in us wants to be who we are. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. This has just been an electrifying afternoon. Thank all of you, and thank you, Stephen, for hosting this. And uh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for coming, and we will see you next time we get together. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.